So what can a hypnotist do to help a person who's an addict? Other than the process Scott just demonstrated, which, by the way, would be helpful to anybody. And this is one of the things that I think was valuable in this process, is we can recognize that anything, even if it's not exclusive to addiction recovery, can be brought in and our clients can find benefit, whether it's success financially or whether it's success by uh, breathing in oxygen rather than nicotine, uh, carbon dioxide, whether it's any other success, those processes can be useful. But Scott and I actually brainstormed a specific list of things that hypnosis could be used for. What we're going to do today from this point forward is we're going to go through this list and we're going to demonstrate each one of these things and you're going to do some of these things as well. So you don't necessarily have to write this down uh, because we'll get to all of um, so I see people poised with their pads. If you try to keep up with me, you're going to go crazy. One of the things that we can use hypnosis for as a tool is to decrease the severity or the symptoms of withdrawal. Now, I hear a lot of hypnotists say, what do you mean withdrawal? All you have to do is hypnotize or withdrawal away. Uh, that tells me that this hypnotist has a very real lack of understanding of the biochemical nature of drugs and the effects on the brain and brain chemistry. The reality is withdrawal is very real. It is exacerbated by emotional states, conflicts, uh, abilities, etc. Uh, for some people it is surprisingly harsh and for other people it is surprisingly not harsh. I'm always amazed at which of my smokers, for example, smoke three or four packs a day and come back to me and say I had zero symptoms, and which of my smokers who smoked 10 cigarettes a day come back and tell me that they want to tear their eyeballs out. And it's completely ununiform it in is. duration as well. Exactly. And, uh, and, and we have to recognize a couple things with withdrawal from drugs and alcohol that people can die as a result of withdrawal. In fact, the news story from the, is this Volusia County, or how are you saying? Volusia yeah, County? Volusia. Yeah, whatever this county is, right here. I think it's Volusia. I think it is Volusia County, Volusia. yeah. Uh, Volusia County Jail, last week, prostitute taken into custody in uh, Daytona, uh, died in her jail cell. Um, she had no medical treatment for her withdrawal, and so it's a big news story, and the reason it's a big news story is, here was a victim who you arrested, and because of your own lack of knowledge in your law enforcement procedures, you let a woman who was a mother of two children die. That was a direct result, this news story from this county this last week, of professionals, law enforcement professionals, but it could be hypnosis professionals or any other group of professionals, not knowing the signs and symptoms of withdrawal and the necessity for medical treatment. Now we have one physician here. Do you have any um, nurses here? Many nurses, usually a couple of nurses in the room. Yeah. But uh, the uh, physical effects of withdrawal are, are, are something we have to recognize. And this means we have a responsibility when we are working with addicted clients to make sure that during the detox phase there is appropriate medical supervision from a licensed medical provider. And by the way, uh, people always talk about heroin addiction, right? That's the opiate uh, detox is the one that gets all the press, right? It's not the most dangerous by a long shot. Alcohol. Alcohol is way more deadly to detox off of than heroin. And only about 5% of alcoholics ever manifest the DTs, the delirium tremens, but if you're not a physician, how are you, how are you gonna know? So this is one of the reasons we're gonna talk about who's appropriate for what level of care. Uh, we have to recognize that if we're not playing on a team, if we're in private practice like I am, I'm only seeing people for hypnosis who are already detoxed. And there's other symptoms that are way less exciting than death. You know, just sleep loss, irritability, you know, things like that. So it's, it's a spectrum uh, of issues. But, but hypnosis can be used to decrease the severity of withdrawal. And um, as we used to say in the treatment center, uh, their plane is landing. And I'm going to show you using hypnosis how to make that a smooth landing. Second thing on our list here, forgiveness of self and others. Um, have you ever made a major decision in your life that had major consequences that you're maybe even still paying for in one way or another? Or that, that really distressed you in a part of your life that will continue to distress you? We've all had those experiences in life. Um, regrets. 
Uh, forgiveness of self is really important because it's hard to move to belonging or security or significance when we're living with regret of the past. Hypnotic methods ranging from processes like Scotch has used to specific mindfulness training are tools for helping people to live fully in the now. Um, uh, I added a, a 2.5 here on my list. Um, hip hypnotists can help addicts use hypnosis as a way to get high. Now, there's some controversy in this, we'll talk about what the controversies are, but when John Serbo shows up later on this morning, or probably this afternoon, because I think he's teaching a class right now, I'm actually going to guide him through a process, and we're going to see John Serbo drunk or high. Right here in this room. Uh, and, uh, and there's a reason why I picked John Serbo for this demo, and uh, I'll talk about that when I do the demo. But I want you to recognize that with some clients, this could actually be a valuable process for a number of different reasons. Uh, but uh, anything that happens in hypnosis happens in the real world as well. And while a sedative hypnotic may be used to induce a state of intoxication, hypnotics can be used to induce intoxication. So we'll have some fun with that later on. Um, uh, hypnosis can be used as a motivator. Use hypnosis to motivate your clients all the time as a as primary tool, motivational psychology. Absolutely. And uh, you know, motivation to uh, to change, motivation to take control, motivation to achieve, uh, to, to to set goals, to achieve goals. By the way, if you aim for nothing, what will you hit? Nothing. And how often will you hit nothing? All the, All the time. So hypnosis is one of the best tools for goal setting that I know. Um, hypnosis. I've heard it explained many times, is the bypass of the critical factor with positive suggestions inoculating us against all kinds of negative self-talk so that we can be empowered to live in the world around us. Well, you've heard the expression, what fires together, wires together, and discussions of neurotransmitters and how subconscious associations can be ingrained. Well, hypnosis is a tool for changing, whether you want to look at it from this perspective, the neurochemistry of our associations or simply the anchors that we've created to various behaviors, times, and places. Um, and if you don't think, if, you know, a lot of people think, you know, hypnosis is a special state. Everything that happens in hypnosis happens in the real world too, and addicts are really good at creating anchors. It's five o'clock, it's time to drink. So the clock says five, they start to drink. You know, I'm bowling, that means I must drink. I'm, I'm bored, that means I must drink. I'm hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Right. I Therefore, must. I must drink. I'm, I'm tired, and what relieves my fatigue faster than anything? Cocaine, actually. Let's do some. Yeah. Time zone difference. You're teaching this class at 6 in the morning. Yeah, right. Well, right now it is uh, it's 8.15 for right. me. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really... But, yeah, if we had done a bunch of cocaine together before... Uh, this, that we'd be halfway done by now. It'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so we have anchors that we've set to all these things. You never get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That's the action that you hear frequently. Uh, loneliness is a is is a, is an association. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll go do right. heroin. It's supposed to be eat worms. It is supposed to be worms, but uh, do heroin. This is the association my adult clients have created. But it, it was so originally eat worms. So worms, worms, are, get older, worms are a gateway. Gateway drug. drug. Yeah. yeah, worms are a gateway drug. And then they <laughs> sit. You get these people. They feel lonely, and they go, "What am I going to do? I need to have a mute button." And alcohol and opiates are wonderful mute buttons. And so when they have an emotion they don't want to feel, you know, they just say, "Okay, I don't want to feel this. What can I do? What's the technology that I can use to not feel this?" And drugs are a shortcut. So then they are sitting on their floor with their back against the couch, you know, with a needle in their arm or a bottle of pills in their hand, they're like, I don't feel lonely, I don't feel my legs, I don't feel anything. <laughs> Success. The big book of AA says we drink essentially because of the effect produced by alcohol. The effect produced by alcohol for most alcoholics is homelessness, sanatoriums, jails, <laughs> prison, uh, loneliness, isolation. Um, but at least it makes them feel different. It might not make them feel better. It actually might make them feel worse, but it makes them feel different. And recognize that those are powerful anchors that we can deal with hypnotically. Um, to reframe and release 
trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I'm not a big fan of regression to cause. Re re regressing my clients so I can go back to the cause is, I think, a futile effort. Now, does that mean clients can't get well if they go to regress to cause? No, lots of people get well despite regress to cause. Because the most important variable in any type of therapeutic relationship is, does the person who I'm working with care about me? This is why people who are, have you ever met people who you're like, how the hell can they help anybody? Right? You've met some people and you're like, that person is a skilled helper? Right. They're, they're, there's somebody who's going to relate to them. Okay? And the reality is, is despite their methods, they probably are still helping some people. Because they can create a strong therapeutic they relationship. Can create a relationship. So, but for us, I'm going to assume that we're the normal ones. Um, the question I have is, okay, I understand that people get well because of the therapeutic relationship, but I want to increase the likelihood of success. So it doesn't mean that I won't use a method like aversion therapy or a breast cause. But I'm going to look for what does the research say are the most effective methods, and those are the primary interventions, the things that I'm going to use. And the research at this particular time is really focused on ACT therapy, contextual psychology, mindfulness based stress relation. Uh, avoidance of relapse cues. Before anything happens, something always happens. Nothing ever just happens. Addicts didn't just relapse. Before that relapse, there was always something that happened. It was almost always behavioral, emotional, psychological, or spiritual. And those same cues keep re-emerging in our clients' lives. Before every relapse episode, these same four things were present. So how can we use hypnosis as a tool to identify relapse cues and then break those associations so alternative behaviors can take place. We can use that with direct hypnosis. We can use that with metaphor and direct hypnosis. We can use that with NLP techniques. When I talk to people who've relapsed and we're kind of debriefing what's been going on and all that, I'll say, well, what happened before that? And they say, well, I got in a fight with my mom. No, no, before that, I didn't go to work. No, before that. That was it. No, no, before that, I woke up. That was the beginning of my day. No, before that, I was asleep. Before that, I went to bed. Before that, how far back? There's, no, it was the fight with my mom. You relapsed on Wednesday. I'd like to start on Saturday and work our way forward. I'd like to talk through, let's look not where you fell, let's look where you tripped. And let's look what got you knocked off. Because why did you get resentful and fight your mom? What was your mindset stuff, right? Because we started looking at that thing made me relapse. And this is something we're going to talk about later when we talk about locus of control, where we get them to own responsibility for their successes and their failures, not in a not in a shaming way, but in an empowering way. And so when you look at that, you get to the point where you can say, oh, I did these three things two days ago, and two days later I had set myself up to fail. And I, do, I was only looking at the effect, not the cause. Um, so when you look at relapse prevention, you look at reframing triggers and all those things, uh, I think there's a big piece there that's very empowering to do, but we'll get into it later. Everybody stuck in the chair taking a deep breath. And I want you to repeat after me. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. I'm smart enough. I'm smart enough. I got it. People like me. And I got it. People say that. Now say that on your own. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And I got it. People like me. And uh, Al Franken made fun of, Stuart Smalley made fun of uh, uh, affirmations, particularly in the context of the 12-step programs, uh, to great success in the 1980s and Saturday Night Live. And, uh, He's from Minnesota. Yeah, I know. From, uh, there you go. He's surrounded, <laughs> by great that state. That, uh, surrounded by that Hazleton influence. <laughs> uh, and that's where Jack Handy came from, too. Uh, and. Uh, and, and, and I've always loved Stuart Smalley's affirmation because you know what? It's basic, it's effective, and it's good. It's memorable. It's memorable. And, uh, and I use affirmations as a tool in hypnosis all the time. So does Robert Otto, by the way. Yeah. His gold blossom, have you guys? Uh, yeah, orange blossom. Or, orange blossom, excuse me. Orange blossom. Although I like the idea of gold blossom. There we go. Gold Upgraded blossom. it. Yeah. Um, no, the orange blossom. Have you guys heard his orange blossom yes. story? And it's, it's it's from when he was doing the uh, the road shows, Smoking. right? 
Yeah, cessation. He, he had this smoking cessation program where he would go on the road and he was town to town. He was doing it on a bus and he was doing it on a, on a private plane because he was hitting so many towns so fast. And he was using affirmations uh, and, and anchors and triggers and to great success. By the way, if you want a copy of Orange Blossom, I don't know if Bob Otto's got it on his website or not, but uh, he gave permission to uh, Roger to record it. And so you can go to Roger Moore's website, which is hypnosishealthinfo.com. And you can get a copy of Orange Blossom as read by Roger Moore uh, for free on his website. So it's Bob Otto script, but with Roger Moore reading it. And Roger used to attend this convention. He hasn't for years, but I'm assuming some of you know Roger Moore. He's the and best. Roger has just a great voice. It's an excellent MP3. I recommend uh, all my clients have a copy of it. So you go to Hypnosis Health Info. You can go to the download section, and you can download Bob Otto's Orange Blossom session for free. Roger's site. Ask Bob Otto for it. He might give you one. Chances are he's going to give you Roger's also. He probably would. <laughs> <laughs>